Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, more about the Institute later. So I, I'm a physicist. I have a master degree in physics and a PhD in material science. And yeah, okay, so I think that's uh, for my, for my, uh, okay. Uh, so where, where am I? So uh, the, the ICTP is based in Trieste in Italy, which is this uh, black spot here on the map of Europe at, at the Adriatic Sea. So it's, uh, for us, it's a mid-sized town. So somebody, some would say a small town and uh, at the sea. So, and uh, so there are some, big regattas going on, actually the biggest in, uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, it's quite impressive. And um, so there's also nice castles and uh, nice buildings to see uh, in the city. So it's very, um, very um, city where it's, I mean, life is quite easy and simple. And uh, so, and near to the castle, so this is the castle and here on the right, we have uh, my institute where I, I am now. Uh, so, and, um, so maybe I can say a few words about my institute, what it is about and what we do. So um, it's, um, it's an institute that has two tasks. One is to do world-class research. And the second one is to foster scientific uh, development in the world. So, uh, so it, uh, it was founded by Nobel laureate Abdul Salam to enhance international cooperation through science. So he was a Pakistani born scientist and he experienced the difficulty of doing a high level science in his home country. So he felt the lack of connection with the, with the, with the, with the world of advanced research. And that's why he founded this institute. So, so where we have a twofold mission to do world-class research and to build uh, science capacity in the developing world. And uh, so from the organizational point of view, it's, uh, it's ruled by, by three entities, the, the Italian government, the UNESCO, the United uh, Nations Agency for Education and uh, Culture and Science, and the International Atomic Energy Agency. So, so administratively, we are a part of uh, an institute uh, um, uh, of uh, which is part of UNESCO, and so we are a truly international uh, enterprise. And uh, so um, we do research in, uh, in in mainly theoretical physics and mathematics. So and we cover a broad range of, uh, but not only because we also have a, se a section for applied physics where we have uh, telecommunication experts. Um, um, and uh, optics experts and so on, laser experts. So, and, but otherwise we cover uh, many fields in theoretical physics. So historically the first and still the most active is the high energy uh, section where Bobby Acharya uh, is, which you, whom you, you might know. The condensed matter and statistical physics section, which is the section I'm part of. Then mathematics and applied physics I already mentioned. Earth system physics, where there are people involved in uh, climate and uh, and uh, investigation of earthquakes, and uh, yes, yeah, so actually the head of the of the climate part is also part of the International Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace a few years ago. And we had the last uh, the last section that was founded a few years ago. It's a uh, quantitative life sciences, which. Uh, uh, tries to use the methods of theoretical physics to investigate uh, biological systems and complex systems of a different kind. And we have initiative in sustainable energy, which is also a part I'm involved in, and high performance computing. So this is a bit uh, the field of activities uh, research-wise, and we have a lot of uh, opportunities of collaboration and support for scientists everywhere in the world. So. Uh, norm, and in normal times, we would have a rich programs of conferences and courses everybody could attend and we have uh, possibility to support travel. Now everything is uh, online, what can be done and the rest is postponed to next year. So, and we, and even in, in under this aspect, we are truly uh, an inclusive enterprise. So with, uh, with visitors from all over the world, these are the numbers from, uh, 
uh, the global numbers uh, from uh, since uh, 1970. So you see all continents, all parts of the world are, are really represented. So, and this is truly a place where people meet and, uh, and can establish collaboration and all courses and so on. So uh, about myself, and now I'm going to switch to the to the most uh, more scientific uh, part of uh, of this uh, of this uh, lecture and talking about a bit the sense of what I do. So so I am uh, a condensed matter physicist, uh, computational material scientist, and I investigated physical process taking place in solids and liquids. For example, how electron solids are excited by light. How does this depend on the composition and the structure of the solid? How they are transported to the surface? How they participate in chemical reaction at the surface? So these are all questions that are uh, physically interesting. So there are fundamental questions there, but also related to uh, applications of general interest. So and um, okay, these are these are uh, in these physical processes are mostly quantum processes. So um, most of the time, I mean, the main equation I, I, I try to solve in, in particular cases, the Schrodinger equation, and, uh, and mostly this is done by, by the use of supercomputers. This is a computational work because these are many electron systems that cannot be solved exactly or, or uh, even, uh, even uh, I mean, uh, by, by analytical means. So this is uh, a brief introduction of, uh, of myself. Uh, I will now uh, move to the, to the proper physical talk. Let me uh, switch to the other set of slides. Uh, okay, yeah. So, so this is, yes, uh, view, full screen. Uh, where I'm trying to give, uh, a, I mean, a general view with some some concrete examples of uh, first what's what's the general purpose and logic and uh, of the of the field, what what are the questions we are trying to answer, and how this is uh, uh, what's the, the interest uh, behind this uh, this kind of question, uh, and uh, I will show you a bit. Uh, uh, the methods that are uh, that are used that I use, and uh, and uh, yeah, I will briefly show a couple of examples of how what kind of uh, of uh, understanding we can get into the system we study. Uh, so again, this is a picture of uh, of the ICTP. Um, so okay, so there are I mean mostly um, I'm interested in the in um, in the materials and in the solid state. So the big question is, do I start from, from the general materials uh, and solid state issues, or do I start from, from the problems I'm interested in? So I chose first to start from, from the general problem interested in, but clearly some of the methods I use are employed uh, in materials and systems which have very different applications. So, so the materials I'm interested in are those that uh, uh, are connected to the to the energy challenge. So are functional materials, materials that absorb and convert energy, and uh, and are relevant exactly for the energy challenge. So I think this is uh, something you have heard of. So uh, the world needs clean, sustainable energy. And this is one of the big challenges. So as you see, the, the, the energy consumption is uh, steadily growing and, uh, and uh, many of, the, of uh, the sources of this energy are problematic either because they are polluting or because they are uh, uh, very limited in, uh, I mean, they are available in limited amounts, so they are not non-renewable. So, uh, so, uh, Generally speaking, there is a, a shift towards uh, renewable energy. In particular, I'm interested in uh, in the use of solar energy, efficient um, harvesting and converting of uh, solar energy. And and one important point is that so nowadays um, there is a lot of photovoltaics. So people produce electricity directly from solar energy. This is very nice, but uh, there is a problem of storage. 
So uh, the sun, as many other renewable sources, are irregular, and this increases the importance of energy storage. So a normal electric grid uh, in, a, in a normal country doesn't have any possibility to store electricity in large amounts. So, so because it was built with the, with the power plants in, in mind that can be uh, um, switched on and off uh, according to the need, which is not always true for all of them, but for example, gas power station can be switched on and off in a few hours. So they can react really in real time to uh, consumption. Uh, whereas if when you are dealing with uh, renewable energy, you have to uh, rethink um, the whole infrastructure in particular, uh, you have to think that you will need an, inc you have an increased need uh, to store energy somehow. And uh, so some of the, I mean, one of the, of the, um, of the solution that are uh, coming to, into consideration are batteries, but of course we are talking about uh, uh, system scale uh, uh, energy storage. So batteries uh, are unlikely to be the solution. So a different approach, which is summarized in these two things, is to use solar energy, for example, to um, perform chemical reaction, produce fuels, which could be hydrogen, could be hydrocarbons, could be different uh, chemicals, and uh, which are easy to store. Once you have produced methane, methane, we, we know very well how to store it. Once you have liquid hydrocarbons, uh, this is, uh, you, we have the whole infrastructure to, to employ it in a normal way. And, but the important point is that you would produce these hydrocarbons using CO2 and water. So the overall carbon uh, balance of the, of the overall uh, cycle would be neutral and it would be an efficient way to use, uh, um, uh, to use solar energy that circumvents or uh, circumvents the problems of photovoltaics and is therefore um, a, a good complement to photovoltaics. Uh, and there are also sectors where, where electricity, I mean, batteries and electricities and, and uh, capacitors are not a good solution. So, for example, airplanes have a high, um, um, I mean, have high requirements in terms of energy density and power density of the fuel. So liquid hydrocarbons are, are difficult to substitute for that kind of applications for, for the massive airplanes. We have so so and that's why a lot of people are interested in in uh, to develop systems that use solar energy to produce fuels which could be hydrogen which is however itself difficult to store hydrocarbons methanol so the whole range of solutions so uh, well I think I already mentioned that and this is a bit the idea in short is that you have solar radiation only during daytime, and this is the yellow thing in the best case, because even that is not guaranteed. And during daytime, you have more uh, energy, you can harvest more energy than you need, but then during the night, you don't have anything. So if you manage to, um, to uh, use this extra energy you, you cannot use during the day to produce solar fuel, then you can use it uh, uh, in, uh, in different times. So this is uh, uh, a bit the idea uh, uh, around uh, doing chemistry uh, with, uh, with um, solar energy and, uh, and producing uh, fuels that. Of course, uh, the problem is why is a problem of materials. So catalysts, photocatalysts, electrocatalysts that are able to efficiently harvest solar energy and efficiently uses to perform these chemical reactions, which are often quite difficult to drive. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is a very stable molecule. So to, to get it and to break it to, to, um, to perform the reaction you want to have is, is not an easy task. And, uh, and also you, you will have rec technical requirements on what you want to have. You usually want to have a single, a single product or just 
uh, not any product. Usually, if you start reacting, uh, I mean, you can always drive these molecules to react by having very high temperatures, or but but you always uh, usually uh, obtain a, a wild combination of different uh, chemicals, and this is not exactly what you want. So there are many different routes to do this. I'm mainly interested in the one where you have a material that is photoactive, so it solves light, and directly use the electrons, the excited electrons, to perform the chemical reaction. So I'm mainly interested in photocatalysis, uh, though often pure photocatalysis doesn't work, so you still need uh, um, to uh, provide also uh, some support for these reactions. So that's why I write photoelectrocatalysis. So this is this is the particular um, subfield I'm interested in. So functional materials that do this, uh, but of course the field is very very broad. And uh, generally speaking, when we talk about functional materials that perform these uh, these uh, tasks, we are talking about nanostructured materials. So materials that have been modified at nanoscopic level, and I, I, I show here a few examples, to uh, be optimized for the function they have to, to perform. So for example, in, in solar cells, you might use in disensitized solar cells, you might have titanium dioxide nanotubes. So you see here from above, the, the holes and the, along the longitudinal axis in these uh, micrographs. And of course, in the, in the solar cell, it's important to have this morphology because electrons can be transported along the tube very easily, while at the same time having a high surface area to absorb photosensitive molecules on the surface. So, so the particular morphology is very important to, to uh, optimize the task. Or in, uh, in fuel cells, so in fuel cells, you produce electricity by uh, using hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and these reactions are, are open, often happen, uh, take place on catalysts and the best catalyst is platinum, but it's not just platinum, it's platinum, nanoparticles of platinum with high uh, activity uh, facets exposed because not every crystallographic uh, surface of platinum behaves in the same way. So we are talking, okay, there is no scale here, but we are talking about few nanometers, nanoparticles, that are the core of, uh, of the functional behavior of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this system, or even in batteries. So this is, okay, this is not a commercial solution. This is a subject of research, people study, silicon nanowires uh, as a nanode for lithium batteries. So um, in the batteries you have in your pocket in the mobile phone, usually the anode is made by graphite. So lithium enters the graphite enters and goes out of the graphite as you discharge and charge the battery. But li uh, silicon can in principle absorb much more lithium. So, so uh, this, this means you would have uh, a lighter battery which can have more lithium, so store more charge at, uh, at, at the same uh, mass, uh, but has the problem that silicon expands a lot when absorbing this lithium. So they hope by using a morphology like this, on one side to give space for silicon to expand without breaking, on the other side, through the wire morphology, they, uh, they still keep the electric con contact with the substrate and they allow electrons to go in and out all the time. So, so, so in all these examples, the nanostructuring of the material is crucial for the, for the working of the material on one side. On the other side, one thing that is not clear from this, uh, from this slide, but it's crucial, is that um, a, the surface of materials is very uh, reactive, of, of most materials very reactive towards the environment. So, uh, and, and a nanomaterial is a material that is composed mostly of surface, if you want. So, so the, the, the behavior of this material changes and also the appearance of this material changes quite a lot depending on the environmental condition it's exposed to. So, and, 
And this can be, this behavior can be different from the bulk material. So knowing how platinum, a piece of platinum behaves in air doesn't necessarily tell you how these nanoparticles behave in air. You have to learn how, how these particles react in air. And, um, and this, uh, yes, uh, uh, okay, and I'm coming back to this later. So, uh, so understanding the functioning of these nanostructure materials means also understanding how they change under environmental conditions, under operating conditions. So, and this is true for the system of interest of mine. So photocatalysts for solar fuels, uh, here I depict an electrochemical cell where you have a photoactive electrode. So you do have, uh, you do provide uh, uh, an electrical bias, but you also have photons coming from the sun to perform reactions like evolution of hydrogen from water. Photovoltaic systems where we study, for example, dye molecule attached to the titanium dioxide and we, we, we try to understand how the electronic structure and the, and the chemical composition of the dye affects its water absorption, uh, sorry, photoabsorption behavior and the transfer of electron to the, to the electrode. And finally, materials for batteries. So in all these, uh, these are all materials have a different uh, complex composition with defects, uh, dopants, so uh, that affects their behavior. They live in a complex environment, so in liquid, uh, in water, so in other liquids, uh, they could be organic liquids, but not uh, ionic liquids. So, uh, and and uh, the processes that together make up the the functional behavior. So. Or from the macroscopic point of view, you are interested, for example, in the current or in the in the amount of hydrogen that is produced. But we are interested in decomposing this, splitting this general problem into the elementary physical steps that lead to that result. So, and to understand those elementary processes like photoabsorption, the charge dynamics. So, what happens to the electrons once? The photon has been absorbed. These are excited electrons that live in a solid. How? What happens to those? Will the energy be lost in the heating of the solid, or will this electron get to the surface and be able to participate in the chemical reaction? And how this do this interface or surface reaction take place? So we we split up the big problem into elementary physical uh, steps, and we try to understand these by our methods. Um, yes, okay, so uh, so the, the picture, so summarizing the, the, the main idea behind my field is summarized in this slide. So um, we want to understand how the environment, which means the pressure of the gases, the temperature, if there is an applied voltage, the pH, the solar illumination affects the properties of the material. So it's atomic structure, it's stability, it's electronic properties and so on. So, and this is crucial because as we said, nanostructure material are very sensitive to the environment. So if you put a piece of platinum, a jewel of platinum, it will not be oxidized. But if you put a nanoparticle of platinum, it will be very easily oxidized under reaction conditions. So we have to understand this and, and the second step, crucial, is to understand how this modification of the material affects the functionality of the material. So for the photocatalytic activity, for lithium storage capacity, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and the, the goal, uh, if you want the long-term goal, is to invert these two arrows and go to this arrow and to do materials design. So having a task you want to perform optimally, uh, being able to understand what is the material with the best structure stability and under what environmental condition this can be realized. So uh, this is uh, a bit the, the, uh, the, the golden uh, goal of, of, of the field. And, um, and we do this by computational methods. So this is computational material science mainly using density function theory and high performance computing, which I'm going to mention uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, 
So, of course, um, in this field, being given the complexity of the materials of the system and uh, what we do is we study some aspects of the problem and this means we are always in tight contact with experimentalists. So our techniques are complementary to those uh, that are used by the experimentalists. So in, in uh, I want to give you a brief idea, if you have never seen that, of what we really do. So how does our method look like? What does it mean? So what we do is atomistic simulation. So we actually have explicit atoms in our system and electrons. So we have atomic nuclei and electrons. And atomic nuclei follow classical mechanics. This is good enough in, uh, in a lot of cases, not always, but, uh, uh, but uh, in, uh, in the vast majority of the problems we deal with, in the first approximation, you can think of the atomic nuclei as classical particles, while the electrons are quantum particles. So we, we solve explicitly the quantum problems for the electron to study the electronic structure of the solids, of the molecules, and how the electrons, uh, the dynamics of the electrons in these systems. And uh, well, we use adiabatic approximation to decouple these two motions. So um, we, we, we try to simplify the system by, by some approximation. And what you have at the result is shown here on the right. This is a snap, these are three different instant of the dynamics, uh, molecular dynamics of, uh, of a platinum salt. So uh, the dynamics, the simulation was run in a lot of water, which is not shown, but you have a platinum, so the platinum ion, which is bound to two chlorine ion and two water molecules. So, and this is how this salt is called cis platin, uh, exists in, in, in uh, liquid water. And then you, we reduce the salt, so we add one electron, and this one electron goes into an orbital uh, and an isosurface of the, of the probability density of this orbital is shown here in blue. So when you put an electron, it goes to this state, but as a consequence of the addition of the electron, so in chemical terms, by the reduction of the salt, the system evolves, so the atomic positions change, but also the orbitals, electronic orbital changes at the same time, and the salt changes its nature, releases water, and only platinum and the two chlorine ions are left. And you see the orbital, the electrons is filling, changes accordingly. So we evolve electronic and ionic states in parallel, and to understand the behavior of the system, we can really calculate a wide range of properties, so binding electronic properties of materials, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, the thing is not so simple. And the main problem in the whole business is that for the electrons, given a certain positions of the nu uh, atomic nuclei, we have a many electron Schrodinger equations. So we have a wave function, of, which is a function in principle of all electronic coordinates. And we have a Hamiltonian shown here, where, which contains uh, explicit electron-electron interaction. So this is a huge problem. This is basically uh, a problem that is not solvable, neither exactly, but not even, uh, um, not even uh, um, approximately for systems of interest, because you have to think that uh, our models, simplified as they might be, may have hundreds or thousands of electrons. So this is a function of 3000 coordinates and, and you have explicit interaction. So this is a huge problem that nobody knows to solve uh, in exact form and the complexity of this wave function is huge. So, so there is no way you can really deal with this problem in the general terms, but what we rely on is a very powerful theory called density functional theory for which uh, Walter Kohn won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry a few years ago. So actually, the, the theory was started uh, being developed in the 60s and became uh, practical uh, methods to do computations in the 80s. And since the 90s has been really flourishing as a method. So, 
So it's a very powerful method and from the reason Walter Kohn was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years ago. So uh, I, I'm not uh, going too much in the details, but the main point is that they devised a way to reformulate the many particle Schrodinger equation, which is basically impossible to solve in practical terms, to uh, a system uh, of equations, and now they are called Kohn-Sham equations, which uh, are very similar. So you still have a quantum uh, kinetic energy term, you still have the external potential, uh, but first this is a single particle uh, equation. So it's um, and uh, and the the explicit electron electron interaction you see you had a, a sum over all pairs of electrons is substituted by some um, kind of average uh, term so so which depends only on the total density of electrons so it's a kind of allow me this uh, this uh, to use this term it's a kind of mean field equation. Uh, that describe part electron electron interaction mean field terms if you have heard these uh, these expressions before so with the advantage that uh, you reduces your problem to a single particle problem where you have uh, i mean the effect of all electrons are mimicked by this uh, potential that now in this equation is a kind of uh, external potential though it depends on the density of of electrons and of course, this has to be solved self consistently because the density itself depends on the orbitals, and the orbitals are the solution of the problem for this Hamiltonian. So you have to solve it self consistently. Uh, but in principle, um, if you were able to solve it self consistently with the exact expression of this potential, you would have a solution which is equivalent to the original one in some sense. The problem is that you don't know this expression exactly. So this is just a, a Coulomb-like term, but you have this additional term which contains all we don't know about uh, 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 interacting system. It's a so-called exchange and correlation potential, and uh, it's not known in exact form. So, so in practice, you have to introduce approximation approximate description of this extra term, exchange and correlation potential. And, um, and this makes the overall uh, method an approximate method, a very powerful one, but an approximate. And there is a whole, uh, I mean, uh, understanding um, how to write this exchange and correlation potential and which, which uh, formulation is good to describe which effects in solid and molecules is a field of research on its own. For us, it's enough to say that uh, uh, people kind of know how to describe, to describe these for, for a lot of, uh, of cases. I mean, there are very difficult cases where, where, where we still don't know how to operate, so strongly correlated materials and so on, but for many weakly correlated materials, we do have recipes to solve this uh, approximate uh, formulation in, uh, in an efficient way. So, so we deal with uh, density functional theory solutions for the electronic structure of the system. And, uh, and this allows us to uh, have uh, a tool to study materials in realistic ways. Um, with many development. This is just a basic, basic uh, theory. Um, and uh, okay, yes. Um, so the kind of uh, systems I'm interested in are like this. So you have a piece of, in this case of iron oxide, which is able to absorb uh, light and the excited holes and electrons in the solid, actually the holes in this case, participate in the oxidation of water. So water at the surface of this iron oxide is decomposed and oxygen is released. Gases oxygen on one side and protons, so H plus is given to the electrolyte and reacted away on the other side. So uh, we, we, uh, we, we select of all these huge macroscopic system, uh, which is very problematic, we select 
uh, some sub-processes that are crucial and we try to investigate them. So in particular, we're interested in this process here at the anode, which means at the iron oxide. So the, the production of oxygen from water in presence of excited charges. And we, uh, so of course, the, the iron oxide looks much more complicated in reality. You see here a, a picture of, of, the re, of a real uh, sample. And we try to understand some of the process that take place in this. So we have photoabsorption, recombination, uh, trapping at defects of the charges, the transport of holes to the surface, the reaction with adsorbed species at the interface between the solid and the liquid, and so on and so forth. So you have to have enough knowledge to uh, pare down your problem to something that you can deal with and understand the crucial steps in the overall reaction. So, okay, yes, this is, I'm not going to comment on this, I think, I don't want to. So what we, what we start doing in this particular example, we started by studying the surfaces of iron oxide. So you have to imagine that this is repeated in all direction X and Y. So this is a surface which can be terminated in different way, either have oxygen at the surface or, or be completely covered with iron instead. In which of the termination is stable under reaction condition depends on the condition. So we study the thermodynamics of the surface and we see how the surface energy of the different termination depends, for example, on the presence of oxygen. So we construct diagrams like this uh, or like this when you have oxygen and uh, water vapor at the same time. So every, every color is a different surface termination. So, and we can see how thermodynamics drives changes at the surface depending on the concentration of these species. I'm going very quickly just to give an idea what kind of what we do in practice. And then on the surfaces that are stable under reaction condition, we study the reaction of, uh, of this oxygen evolution. So the splitting of water to build oxygen. And we show diagram for all the reaction intermediates. So we start with water here and we get to oxygen. So uh, without illumination, all the, all the steps are upwards in energy. The reaction does not uh, run by itself if you don't put energy, either in form of or, uh, or light or in form of an electric bias. But we observe how strong this bias must be for the reaction to take place, and we can compare this with experimental results. So this gives a basic idea on the thermodynamics of, this, of the reaction of water splitting or water oxidation at this surface. And we can compare our results with the experimental one to understand if we understand the basic properties of the reaction or there are ingredients missing and this gives us a feedback over what are the elements that are crucial for the reaction to take place and how this is modified. And then, um, of course, this is only thermodynamics, but we would like to understand also the kinetics of this reaction, but this is much more complicated. In that case, we will have to, and this is work in progress, to deal with the whole complexity of the solid liquid interface where you have, when you put a, an oxide, for example, or a semiconductor in contact with the electrolytes or a liquid where you have solvated ions, you have a lot of charge redistribution. So in the solid, and you see the minuses at the surface and the pluses inside, and in the liquid. So you have formation of uh, they are called space charge layer in the solid, double layer in the liquid. You have a whole redistribution of charges which determine the properties of this interface and the, the dynamics of uh, electrons and holes at this interface. So studying all this is quite uh, complicated and uh, that's why uh, I mean, it's difficult to get an atomic, atomistic insight into the structure of these uh, interfaces. That's why mostly people often rely on old models uh, for this. And okay, I think uh, I'm not going more into details of uh, these things. Uh, that's why we want to use our atomistic method to get insight into what happens at the really interface between the solid and the liquid and how. Um, molecules um, 
organize themselves, how this is affected by the presence of an electric field and of charges, and ultimately how this affects the dynamics of the holes at the interface. So as a preliminary, so of course our models are simplified. So this is what we really simulate, a piece of solid in contact with the water, which is a, a minimal model of water. And we can study, for example, how the potential, electric potential drops between the solid and the liquid and see how this depends on the presence of ions how ions and water organize itself at the interface. I'm not going too much into details of this. Um, so, and we hope to gain insight into what happens really there at atomistic level and to, 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 and we hope to be able to provide new insight into how these reactions take place in, in the hope that uh, we can also, with, beside providing basic understanding of the systems, also uh, provide useful recipes this is the hope so so um so i hope i showed you what what first what the general problems are and what are we able to um to investigate about this system so uh in particular i want to stress again in the in a very complex macroscopic system we have to select uh, the processes we want to simulate. We cannot uh, simulate efficiency of this of this device. We can study single elementary physical prop, uh, processes and understand in the details these, which is something on one side, um, if, if somebody is interested in the whole device might be disappointed because we, we are not able to predict the efficiency of the device. On the other side, we are able to see and provide insight into uh, microscopic processes, often experimental techniques are not able to identify or to observe in real time. So it's a complementary approach to experimental characterization techniques. And in particular, I think uh, crucial will be to understand what happens at this solid liquid uh, interface. So, well, I, I think, uh, I mean, it's, it was a general talk, but still I want to thank uh, a lot of people we've been uh, I've been working with in years on this kind of problem. So at ICTP and uh, people that were at ICTP now are around the world, like at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the U.S., in Singapore, in Switzerland, and uh, in Iran. So, and this is uh, um, this is a bit an idea of the science. Uh, now um, I don't know if. Um, uh, want to ask question about this part or maybe it's better if I finish the whole thing and then we you can ask question at the end uh, if there is any urgent question now uh, okay otherwise I will move uh, to the other part so in the last uh, okay I have uh, I will try to be brief in the last part where I talk about uh, something that uh, mm, it's of interest for, for Africa. Um, in part so because in the, in the, I mean, in the context of, uh, of our activities, uh, so I've shared the screen. Um, so I'm involved very much in something that is also in a sense, a relative of the African school uh, for fundamental physics, which is the, uh, because it shares a lot of, uh, of, I mean, the approach and the goals, and which is the African School for Electronic Structure Methods and Applications, which I'm, um, I have the honor of chairing the executive committee of. So I will spend the last, next, uh, I will try to be brief, so the next 10 minutes, talking about the African School for Electronic Structure Methods and Application. So this is our logo. So it was born between 2008 and 2010. So I think more or less at the same time as the uh, ASP. Uh, and uh, it's been uh, a 10 year program endorsed by the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. So we've had uh, a school, a school every two years in a different place in Africa 
and we've built up uh, a community and uh, and connections uh, with the goal of fostering a collaborative network for research and higher education within Africa. And uh, so in correspondence of the end of this 10 year program, we've started revising uh, our, our goals also I mean, after 10 years of activity, also the community has changed, has grown, and the needs have changed. And uh, so uh, we, are, we are in a moment where we are starting new initiatives on top of the two years uh, school. So what it is this school about? It's about computational science. And uh, uh, it has the advantage that uh, you can do uh, world-class research with a modest investment. So, uh, so um, with uh, a difference with uh, some some uh, part of experimental physics that might be impossible to pursue without uh, heavy uh, investments and a large infrastructure, computations can be done at least uh, in, in part with, uh, with a modest investment. And at the same time, computation, computations are important in every area of science and technology. So uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it, um, I mean, the skills acquired in this, in this sector can be very useful. Uh, uh, also outside of this sector can have an impact in various areas of science and technology. And, but okay, computational science is a very broad uh, concept. So the school has, the idea from the start was to have a very limited, in a sense, choice of topics, uh, which is electronic structure, which I tried to give you a, a flavor of in my, in my previous part, uh, or the previous part of my lecture. So it's, uh, on one side, it's an important field because, uh, um, so it's now enough so that uh, you can build up a network and a community of people where people can talk to each other, can, can collaborate and have a joint work because the, the field is roughly the same, but still broad enough to have, uh, um, to be flexible, to have impact uh, um, de depending on the local needs. So a range from fundamental physics, the, so the, understanding the, the fundamental properties of the electronic structure in complex materials, uh, but also have applications that I try to show you. So ca that can range from material science, chemistry, and nowadays biology is uh, very popular. So, so, uh, uh, it's, uh, so we want to build a community of people that can work together and at the same time, they can have an impact. Um, in, in fact, uh, I mean, uh, even even now we see that uh, the European uh, Union, the the the, um, the European Infrastructure for uh, High Performance Computing (PRACE) has launched uh, last two months ago. I think it's already two months ago. Um, a call for projects, computational projects on related to COVID nineteen research. So to understand how virus attack attaches to mole to to cells uh, how drugs attach to the virus and so on and so forth so there are question of of chemistry or, or biochemistry or drug development that can be partly addressed with electronic structure methods so and uh, so and uh, and uh, it started as a school so we have this school where uh, in the last years we try to have a healthy mix between new participants to the field. We are an open community, so we want to welcome new people and have the system grow. At the same time, we have old participants returning to increase their knowledge, but also to uh, grow in terms of collaboration, but also to help tutoring new people. So the community grows in also in this sense. And the school includes basic theory, uh, and methods, so theoretical lectures with the explanation of these and hands-on computing. So it's also a very practical experience where people learn how to do these computations themselves in the course of the school. Uh, and, and in principle, we try to involve each participants in a project uh, so that um, the contact can continue after the school. So it started, as I said, roughly in 2008, the main three people 
that started the whole thing where Richard Martin, who was uh, emeritus at uh, Stanford and in, uh, in um, at Illinois, um, who is one of the fathers of the density functional theory, by the way. So he's, and, and he was one of the three people that started this together with Nitaya Chetty, who's here, who is now in, uh, uh, now it's at the University of Witzwatersrand in uh, South Africa and Sandro Scandalo from ICDP, who's depicted here. So these three people are the people that really started the whole thing, uh, um, providing on one side organizational support from the ICDP, but also the, the role of Richard Martin to uh, um, uh, keep the level very high and, uh, and involving high level uh, uh, scientists in the whole initiative and Nitaya Chetty to keep the whole thing together and, uh, and maintaining and, and have the system, the, the, the contacts growing throughout Africa. So uh, we've had more or less regularly uh, every two years with some delay because of uh, there was uh, some crisis a few years ago. So the next uh, would have been uh, now, actually in June, uh, but has been postponed to next year in Rwanda. And uh, we're going to see how, how things are going to, to happen. And we're also trying to have uh, uh, online activities. We have an international advisory panel, which uh, contains really the top people in the field and related field. We even have experimentalists, but we have to give an idea, Anthony Leggett is Nobel laureate in physics. Uh, so, and we have many of these people are really uh, uh, top scientists in the field of density function theory. So we we um, we make sure that uh, the the level of the school really is uh, connects uh, African community to the rest of the world. And we have an executive committee, which I'm chairing, and together with Omolulu Akinoju, who is the, the director of the Eastern Africa Institute for Fundamental Research in Rwanda, Garu Gebreyesus from the University of Ghana, Shinet Griffin from the, um, um, what's called, um, uh, Berkeley, yes, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California, Richard Martin himself, and Shobana Narasimhan from the uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Science and Research in Bangalore in India. So, also I think this is what I, I forget to say. Forgot to say is that this is really a truly a global enterprise where people from all continents are are involved. Uh, okay, this is a funny moment where we are as computational scientists we have problems dealing with uh, Beamer, um, and uh, this is have has. Uh, um, wide support in terms of sponsorship. So my institute, the ACDP, I think I've mentioned it uh, often enough, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics has always supported this initiative. Uh, the US Liaison Committee for IUPAP, the APS itself, and I'm going to say more about it uh, in a few minutes, as, as is playing in an increasing role in the, in initiatives called, uh, related to electronic structure in Africa. Uh, Thomas Young Center, so which is a uh, center for computational physics in London in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom. The National Science Foundation of the United States. The, uh, the National Center Marvel of Switzerland, which is an excellent center for, for uh, computational research. And the National Institute for Theoretical Physics from South Africa. So these are institutions have continuously supported our activities. And uh, yes, as I said, it's, it's about also community growing. So it's about bringing people together and have them grow and, uh, and establish collaborations and contacts. So here are some pictures of people uh, working together. It's a hands-on experience. So people le really learn to use uh, some of the codes that are used for these kind of activities. In particular, we've been focusing on Quantum Espresso because we have historical ties to the developers of the code, like Stefano de Gironcoli, uh, but uh, we are open and we are getting more and more open to codes. Uh, so people really get to learn how to use uh, uh, advanced codes in the field. Um, 
yeah, okay, I think I'm going to, yeah, some of the high level uh, speakers and lecturers, Roberto Carr, Marc Azida, these are really the fathers of, uh, of uh, the techniques. Rio Maizono, I think I'm gonna skip a bit of this for the, clear, uh, for the sake of uh, shortness. So we have basic lectures and we have hands-on tutorials so where people learn to use the, the techniques. And then we have a time dedicated to small research project, projects that start during the school, but uh, ideally they are continuing afterwards and they can really lead to uh, proper research uh, activities and publications. And uh, yes, and we have a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, collateral activities on, uh, um, yeah, I think I'm gonna skip this. So uh, it's uh, if you look at the at the number, we are in comparison to the ASP, we are a small school. We have a, have a smaller school, so typically we have 40 participants, 40, 50 in each school with a number of returning participants. And uh, but uh, we are a very compact and growing community, and, and we have started from. Uh, from zero and now there are really people being very active. I think I've shown this already with active research groups across Africa and growing. So these are just some examples. Uh, so uh, success stories, okay, the role of the, I think I mentioned this already. Um, yes, so what is happening now? After 10 years, we have revised a bit what the assessment is doing and uh, there are new initiatives. So um, first, um, people that are from the Assessma community, this is not properly an Assessma initiative, but uh, people in the electronic structure between Africa and USA have got a prize by the Innovation Fund of the American Physical Society. So this is a US Africa initiative for electronic structure. Uh, that will result in uh, in workshops in Africa and in the USA. So there is money to bring all the African scientists to the USA and to visit American laboratories. So this is a big uh, initiative that should have taken, I mean, the first workshop should have taken place in Rwanda also now in June, but has also been postponed. But this is really an important activity that will, uh, that is different from the assessment, but will, will very much benefit uh, uh, the same community and is partly driven by, by the people that are also involved in ASESMA. And then, uh, uh, well, okay, here I report the AS, uh, the African School for Fundamental Physics and Application, but I think I don't need to say anything. And AIMS, other important initiatives with a similar spirit, but different uh, concrete uh, uh, directions. So, and, uh, and in this spirit of extending the reach of the school, uh, we have two main, three main developments, if you want. The first is that the new East Africa Institute for Fundamental Physics, for Fundamental Research, sorry, has been established in Rwanda, which will support a lot of these activities in the near future. Second, um, we are expanding the scope behind the main school. Every two years, we are organizing smaller regional schools around Africa. So we have had uh, three or four in the last year, year and a half. So to expand the outreach of, of our community and to serve better the people that are interested. And, and, uh, and third, from the organizational point of view, we have established the assessment net, the network of assessment. So there is now funding to support visits of African scientists to other African scientists inside Africa and to visit European collaborators to Europe. So, and, and vice versa, European collaborators to come to Africa. So it's a small seed money, but uh, it's an important activity to bring uh, the collaboration to the next level be beyond the two years uh, schools. And topic-wise, uh, uh, we are trying to extend also to biology. There are a lot of related uh, of of, uh, of research related to biology, material science, and chemistry. Uh, so 
So the community is growing, our possibility are growing, apart from, I mean, now this uh, period is a bit difficult, but the idea is that we will have a more structured community of people doing research in this field. So if anybody wants to be involved, or if you want to be involved, or if you know people that want to be involved, we're always open to uh, new collaborations, people who want to bring new ideas. So check our website, write to me, look for us on the web. And uh, yes, so it's a quite a focused um, initiative. And I think that's part of its success and involves very high level people. So yes, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicolette. This is... Uh... Uh, it has been very, very nice, and thanks for being available to uh, talk to us. It's uh, greatly appreciated. So uh, we're going to, we should now get to the discussion uh, part, and if people have uh, questions or comments, um, so just uh, either raise your hands or type your questions or, or just, just talk. So. So it looks like uh, people are appearing shy today. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so, um, so are the people involved in different fields of physics, right? The participants. That's right. We do have uh, a, a lot of people who come to ASP who are not in uh, 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 nuclear or particle physics, who are more in material. Oh, okay. Physics and who would certainly benefit from uh, assessment and and uh, and, and uh, the all of the things associated to to the materials that, as you described. Okay. In fact, we we notice in our distributions of uh, the students' uh, background that uh, there are more people who are not in particle physics. Oh, right? so, okay. So so. Uh, it's like 20% of Africa is really engaged in particle physics. Uh, okay. I mean, you have the cluster in Morocco, Egypt, uh, Algeria, a little bit of Tunisia, and South Africa. And then you have people from uh, other African countries who individually participate at CERN and so forth. But their country doesn't have a structured program of uh, of uh, particle physics and the small material physics. Okay, okay. Uh, so, so so I was expecting that there will be more people I to talk here. Okay, yes, I think there, there is questions. somebody who wants to ask a question. Yes, please go ahead, Diallo. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, everyone. I'm Abdul Qadri Diallo. I recognize Mr. KTV, which I meet in uh, ISP in 2014 to Dakar. That's right, yes. And also recognize some of the Steve Mwenza and Beltaco. So thank you for this piece. It is very important. I have some, I have my course in material physics, but more in experimental fields. So I have to improve myself or my knowledge in theoretical or computational because I think uh, nowadays we need the uh, theoretical and computational uh, physics to perform some experimental tools. So I don't, I want to know if in your institution you have to collaborate with experimental uh, researchers to um, how do I say it? To collaborate the results from theoretical to experimental results. So, okay. Um, this can, I mean, the interaction with experimentalists can happen in different ways. So sometimes you just uh, 
uh, read the experimental literature, you find the inspiration, and then you you have your own theoretical project which you bring on on your on your own without a direct interaction. So this is one possibility, and it, this happens quite often. Then you have, and 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 then the the next interaction is at the end of your project when you have some understanding or some results. Then you go back <coughs> to experimentalists, but all in the way through the working of the projects, you are on your own in a sense. The other way is when you di work directly with experimentalists. This is uh, more difficult, I would say, more it can be more rewarding, depends also, I mean, um, it also very much depends. So, I mean, the, the theory has its own time, its own way to address uh, uh, problems and uh, to get to gain understanding. So. Um, uh, the 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 rhythm on how you proceed or the things you look at may be very different. So in some in some cases you are able only at the end to exchange to see what you conclude from what you have seen and what they conclude from what they have seen. Then there are a different kind of experiments where uh, you can really compare one to one. There are uh, high level uh, um, high precision experiments where you can really uh, have to one-to-one -one correspondence between what you calculate and what you see in the experiment. So in that case, you, you work really side by side and every week you, you exchange ideas and results with experimentalists. So for example, if somebody does scanning tunneling microscopy, you know, where you can really visualize single molecule absorbed on the surface, mm -hmm. you, we, we are able to calculate STM images ourselves. So we can really compare experiments by experiments, week by week, what happens, what, you, what kind of, for example, absorption configuration you obtain at the surface. So um, this is of course more difficult because uh, it's, a, it's a learning process. You have to understand what the experimentalists are really doing because sometimes the interpretation of, of experimental results is non-trivial, but also understanding what our results mean. And uh, I mean, being able to talk to experimental is not, um, is not a necessarily an immediate uh, thing to do. So uh, to summarize, I think you can have different configuration. You can work on your own without a direct uh, exchange with experimentalists, or you can really work side by side with them. That's very much depends on on uh, on the problem, on the system, on the kind of techniques they have, and also on the kind of relation you 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 manage to establish with them. Other questions or comments? Uh, just a second question, please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I know in Africa we have uh, the problem to access to computational tools. So if you have an idea uh, to give me to logicians which I can use to uh, maybe it can be benefit for me for experimental uh, for theoretical physics in material science, please. So, uh, okay, yes. Generally, it's true that there is a problem with resources, um, but first, the, I see nice problems that can be designed to work on a laptop. So people do research with a laptop sometimes. Of course, if you have a supercomputer, you have many more possibilities and uh, some things are easier, but there are really people that publish work done on a laptop. Second, uh, there are options. So for example, if you have, I think, uh, okay, maybe now they have changed. In, uh, until recently, if you had the collaborator in South Africa, you also had access to the supercomputing uh, facilities in South Africa. I, I, I heard, but I don't know the details, that now you could access them even without having a collaborator there, if you are from elsewhere in Africa. So, so there, are, there are ways to uh, have access to resources if, if you need them. So, and, and some, some institutions in Africa do have resources. For example, I know that people at the Africa University of Science and Technology in Abuja were doing a serious computational work there. Uh, Rwanda, they have uh, their own uh, uh, cluster. Um, uh, 
in Khartoum, in Sudan, they had a big uh, facility uh, which had some management problems. But I mean, um, if you, if you, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's always a problem, but at the same time, you also have opportunities around. So, so Diallo, you finished your PhD already, right? You are now a postdoc? Uh, yeah. Um, have you, did you attend uh, any of the assessment school in the past? Uh, no. Okay. So wh where are you? I'm in Senegal. Ah, okay. Okay. I'm in Senegal. At which university? Uh, the University of uh, Ziegenshore, it is in the south of uh, Senegal. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I think you now you have uh, you can you should con contact uh, uh, Dr. Siriani here and uh, uh, you know I can put you in touch with some people in South Africa and myself. Yeah. So okay. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so, then yes. then we can see how how we can get you in yes. contact. Yes. This is also you. general truth. If you have questions or comments or any kind of you can just uh, if you Google me you find my email address or in this slide. It is it is also on uh, on the agenda page. That okay. Is. Yes. So just contact me. I mean, uh, yes. Um, um, okay. Thank you. I will do. Um, yes. Thank Other questions much. or comments. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hey, Beltaco. Yeah, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. And you? Hello. Fine, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Siriani. I am Kataura Beltaco, so I'm calling you from Togo. With coronavirus, I'm locked down here. Okay. So actually, thank you, Ketebi, as well for organizing the webinar. So I wanted to know um, one thing. So for the photovoltaic side, you actually stay on materials you don't go at the device level because um i work on the device level so like for instance where you should your surface <coughs> for instance your surface on with a molecule for instance laying on that surface do you attach some electrode to that one or you just uh, study the material itself well, okay, the, the materials is the electrode, but uh, we don't have uh, really uh, a, an electrical connection, a counter electrode, because this is much too much. The, the scales at which this happen, the size and time scales are completely different from those we can uh, look at. So, so at the moment, uh, the, the whole device understanding and the, uh, the understanding of the elementary processes as we do it is uh, is a, a bit far so but for example we do compare the over potential we calculate with those you obtain in the dark in, a, in an electrochemical device so there are quantities we can compare but we cannot calculate for example photocarbons so how how what, i mean so we uh, we look what we can see is some aspects of the of the system. We cannot uh, directly say, okay, we are going to have this power, this efficiency, because uh, to, in these in these quantities there are truly macroscopic things, like for example the resistance of the whole device, and a lot of microscopic things. So for example, char. Um, um, what is called charge relaxations in the photocatalyst. So when you so excite an electron in the conduction band, this loses energy to phonons, no, to defects. All these processes are each of them. It's very difficult to calculate. Some of them we don't even know how to calculate yet. So, um, which means e in, even if we were able, there are a uh, hundred processes that all participate into uh determining the whole efficiency of the system which means we are not, not able to calculate photocurrents no and and compare them with what you get if you do the whole device measurement but uh, but the hope is that insight into some of these elementary processes knowing what are the most relevant those that are most uh, uh hindering the 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 good activity of the system 
might provide a different kind of insight into the system. So, so we are nowhere near, and I don't have any hope to have a, a, to use my method to to and have simply a one-to-one -one correspond in terms of uh, uh, whole device efficiency. I mean, this is out of question. The 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 kind of uh, the kind of I mean. I, that's why I said we have different kind of experiments. The, the whole device efficiency is crucial, of course, because this is what you want to know in the end. But there are a lot of techniques that characterize, for example, the electrode under operating condition, what surface pieces you have. For example, if you do IR spectroscopy or uh, uh, vibration spectroscopy, you can understand what kind of intermediate reaction intermediates you have at the surface. This is the kind of experiments we can relate to. And it's different from we take a device and we look how efficient this is. So uh, we are simply working on a different set of problems and we, we try to contribute this way. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, actually, I, I thought you actually studied the whole device. So in my understanding, so maybe your, your, your material or your central, uh, your junction is so wide. Okay, so you can, you have a kind of limit in your DFT calculation. Yes, if yes. I get it right. Okay. Absolutely, yes. So yeah, because for instance, we, uh, me, um, I, basically I do quantum transport. So we are interested in the device, the whole device, you know, like you can, attach electrode to it, but your central system is not so big. So you can actually do your DFT calculation of the whole junction, for instance, a molecule, and then okay. attach some goals, and then you do some DFT calculation. So I'm looking for people, maybe in the community of assessment, maybe you can, who, or who does experiment on that one, like single molecular junctions. Experiment and, uh, or calculation? Yeah. Experiment and even calculations, it will be good to collaborate with people who are already working on that because I'm interested in collaborating with people basically in Africa, so I think it will be very good. And the next thing is that if hopefully we can find some people from outside because I know it maybe it's not possible to get something. So, here. so send, send me an email with more details and I will uh, send you some, some information, okay? Okay, thank you. So I, I wanted to say, uh, Ketevi, so uh, with coronavirus, I'm actually locked down in Togo as well. So I, I will be like, I would like to have access to some other resources, like she said, if you can connect me to some kind of uh, sure. computing uh, resources in South Africa, it will be good. Yeah, yeah, thank no you problem. so much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Seriani. Thanks to you. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Uh, so, Nicolas, so I think uh, okay. uh, in the past we discussed, uh, you know, that uh, at some point we'll have a joint uh, ASP uh, assessment. Um, we'll have to discuss it more, uh, uh, how we can make that work in the, in the future. Which well, nice. yes, I think uh, this time we want to come, uh, we, uh, three or four of us, uh, uh, to have a first uh, part in the, in the conference part, right? Sure, so, sure, speak. yeah. Uh, we'll see, I think we are very open and uh, yeah, I think there's certainly many good things we can do. Yeah, we have to still to understand how we will do them. That's so right. Yeah. My my <laughs> but, impression is yeah. that uh, when when things will be a bit uh, quieter, uh, we will have a combination of uh, of physical and online. Right. Probably mm -hmm. traveling will be a bit more difficult, so we'll probably have less people in presence. But we are going to have both at the same time. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, I think. Uh, you know, uh, I, the the initiative of assessment is also extremely appreciated, and uh, I, it's definitely on our side. We want to see that succeed because it's the globe in the global scope of what we want to achieve in Africa and support the complementarity of the school so that we can address all of the needs 
of African students and, and all of the needs of the country. Uh, um, okay. So other, people have other questions. I, I was expecting people in the material physics and so forth to... Yes, there is one question here, Professor okay. Kitabi. Go ahead. Okay, hello, Dr. Nicola. Uh, thank uh, you for your presentation. Thank so you. my question is uh, about as you asked, uh, one of the guy asks you about the resources. <coughs> so the, the issue is that uh, most most people in the African region, they don't have access to uh, supercomputer. So sometimes if their research uh, need supercomputers, sometimes they will just uh, stuck. They cannot continue with the research. So I don't know if Assessma can help either with the asset ICTP supercomputer access if someone has a good proposal or like Chineka so if they can have access to continue with their research. So I happen to be one of them. Uh, I use Chineka for like one year, but uh, okay. now I, I cannot assess. So it would be good if you can help about that. So yes, uh, I mean, um, for the moment, we don't have a general uh, solution to this. Um, people are aware and uh, I mean, um, so, for example, at ICTP, we do have our own cluster. And from time to time, we try to discuss among ourselves whether uh, um, we should open a part to, to general public. But we always come to the conclusion that uh, we don't have enough uh, computer power to do that in generalized way. It's true that if you come to ICTP for a visit, then you do have access to our cluster for a while. So which means, again, if you come, you might have access for one year and that could be enough for, for, a, for, a, for a project. Clearly, this is not a general solution. Uh, it's true that people are thinking about it, even very powerful people like the, the Marvel, the, the, the Swiss Excellence Center Marvel, they are thinking about it and, and they do have the, the also the financial resources to do something like this. It's still not there. So we are not there, but the, we are aware of the problem. Assesma can help because now we have this network, which basically aims at established collaboration within Africa and between Africa and Europe for the moment. And uh, so what, what I see is that many people that establish a collaboration with Europeans, then they have access then to the computers there. So a lot of people are calculating in clusters in Europe through these kind of collaborations. And I, I expect that the same thing will happen with the ASP US Africa initiative. So through collaboration with uh, US based scientists, I expect that people will be able to get access project based on uh, to, to computer resources. Uh, there's still no general solution. There is no center where you can simply apply with a good project get access unfortunately maybe the eifr could add that to the scope uh, that could be something uh, i mean it could yeah be that, that jointly that, by the ictp and the rwandan government for example that uh, uh, that, uh, that i mean we hope that uh, that something will happen but again you need quite a big uh, computing center to sure. provide general service to African scientists. So, um, no, but it could be competitive. You know, when you apply, no, 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 certainly, no, no, certainly. Not all of them will be would be given, right? So, That's for sure. But for yeah. the moment, uh, they also have just uh, limited resources, which are enough for the people that are there in place, plus mm -hmm. collaborators. But it's not uh, something that can be opened. We, we hope to find a way and to find the resources to do it. And I think people are aware of the problem. Uh, I don't have a solution at the moment, yes. Mm -hmm. um, other questions, uh, other comments? So, so I think that there, there are some people uh, from ASP who have uh, visited uh, ICTP. Uh, in fact, there are some students there right now, uh, former ASP uh, students. And uh, also, uh, also the last question, K Ibrahim. Yeah, you that was from Ibrahim. At AUST or where is Ibrahim? He should. I don't know where. Uh, I think I know you. Pro I mean, the picture is not too clear, but okay. Yes, uh, he doesn't. Ibrahim, are you still there? Could you hear the question? 
it's okay. I mean, yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I mean, again, if you have if uh, if questions come later, just just contact me. I mean, uh, I'm very open and uh, yes. So. Yeah. Um, okay, we have uh, one or two minutes left. Uh, if anybody has uh, any requests or any questions. Uh, some people didn't manage to follow the beginning of the lecture because of timing issues and uh, they were interested in the recording. So after we okay. finish, uh, I will put the recording back on the, uh, on the agenda page and uh, people can access it. Okay, okay, great. All right. Uh, yes, is there a question? Yeah, yeah good evening, all. Good, good, good evening. Or? For me, it's good morning. Very good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ketevia and Dr. Seriani, I have a question with regard to the assessment school. Yeah. I don't know who are the people that are uh, eligible to apply to the school, the two week school. I don't know how. What do one need if one can apply to it to the school? I mean, um, so it's given the narrow focus, we expect people to uh, to have some background in quantum mechanics and solid state physics. That's a minimal background. Um, we also check uh, if some people know have some computer knowledge, but we accept, still accept people that have a very, very basic uh, approach to that. So, so the problem, I, I, I think beside the requirement is that, uh, I mean, we have 40 places, uh, uh, including local people. So, so the pro, uh, beside that, uh, w the selection process is quite, uh, yeah, that, um, quite yeah. daunting. Oh, so. Yes. <laughs> I can imagine we have the same thing for ASP where we get uh, 500 applications, but we can only take uh, you know, 70 people and no more. So it's, wow. really, it's a really harsh uh, selection where yes. very, very good uh, candidates we cannot select. It's unfortunate. Yes. Um, Adam, you have a question? Anybody else has any question? Uh, all right, so if that's not the case, um, we should uh, thank uh, Dr. Nicola Siriani. Yeah, if you have a question, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't have a question, but I would like to thank, thank you for uh, sharing me and what we did in the same uh, uh, I. Uh, yeah, I also attend uh, ASB 2018 at Namibia. Yes, I remember you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope to uh, to do my master in outside in my country, but uh, now uh, the weather in Sudan is not uh, nice. That makes us uh, to stay at home like this. Uh, I would like to thank all my colleagues and my teacher at ASB, and that uh, makes us uh, to uh, that like uh, uh, friendship. I connect with uh, Ibrahim from Thailand that speak with you before. Yes, well, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. Ibrahim, yeah, my colleague, he comment before me. Okay. After, yeah, before, uh, speak with you before me, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Siriani, and all the, our teachers. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I hope great. To, you will be safe like, um, from the coronavirus, and all our teachers and colleagues be safe. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you thank Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much. All right. So, on that note, uh, um, so we will stop uh, today and. Uh, 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 thank uh, Dr. Nicola Siviani. Um, his email is on the agenda page. If you want to contact him privately and, and so forth, please go ahead. And uh, um, you can also contact me. I am not in the field that we discussed today, but I also know some of the people that uh, Dr. Siviani mentioned in South Africa, so I can connect you to those people if necessary. 
So, and thank you very much for the All invitation. Right. It was a very nice opportunity, yes. Okay, thank you. So, so I'll end the meeting now and uh, uh, we'll be in touch, Nicola. And, uh, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.